Hey guys, how's it going? Keegan here on a Thursday. It was so great to see everybody yesterday at Youth Group. If you missed yesterday's Youth Group, don't forget that YouTube sermon is still up on this same YouTube page. We'd love for you to check it out. Maybe even take a look at the discussion questions and uh, answer those on your own so that you don't feel like you missed out on anything. But today we're going to be uh, talking about following Christ's example in building up our neighbors. I know that I think we've uh, kind of followed this theme of loving one another this week, and I think it's been a good theme, um, and, and we've we've uh, kind of focused on it for a couple of days. But today, I wanted to kind of leave you guys with the questions or give you the question of how can you build other people up? How can you, as we're going to see, build your neighbors up? How can you build up the people around you? Not seeking to please yourself, not seeking to just selfishly take care of yourself, but to build up the other people around you. So maybe it's your siblings, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your friends. Who can you build up this week and how can you build them up? I know that it's similar to a question I asked earlier in the week, but we're gonna try to get practical today. So maybe it's you need to reach out to somebody that you know is just really wanting this coronavirus thing to end and give them some positive uh, words of uh, affirmation or just building them up, giving them some good advice or just showing them that you're still here or maybe it's helping your siblings out around the house or maybe even just giving them a little more patience. But how can you work it not trying to just be worried about yourself because we're all still stuck in our homes and we, I'm sure some of us have, have fallen into some selfish laziness of trying to take care of just me but how can you try to take care of other people? How can you try to build up other people? That's my question for you today. So let's pray and then jump into Romans 15 and we'll be doing verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for another day to be in your word. We ask now, Lord, that you would allow us to think about how we can build each other up, Lord. How we can follow your son's uh, footsteps, how we can follow what Christ has done, Lord, and not seek to build ourselves up, but seek to build others up. Not seek to serve ourselves, but to seek to serve others, God. We pray now that you would give us those practical ways to build each other up rather than looking to tear each other down or selfishly just take care of ourselves. We thank you for your word, and we pray now that you would allow us to read it together, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So yeah, starting Romans 15, 1 through 13. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Yeah, here we see we're supposed to follow and do what Christ has done as we as we read at the start. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of others who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And it even says in verse two, let each of us please his neighbor and do uh, and please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And then I think verse 13 in chapter five leaves us with a, a great uh, final uh, piece here. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing 
so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. What a great thing for us to read. I, I hope that we all are abounding in hope because of of the fact that God has filled us with joy, with peace, in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit, we may be abounding in hope. And that hope being that we know that we have salvation through Christ. What a, what a great hope that we can trust and we don't have to feel hopeless, but we can abound, overflow in hope and share that hope with others. Secondly, we are back in Mark today. We'll be doing uh, Mark 5, 14 through 20. Mark 5, 14 through 20. We're going to see what happens after uh, Jesus just got done sending the legion out of the man. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Yes, so we see the people are scared of what Jesus has done. But before Jesus leaves, uh, he, he leaves. He tells the man, uh, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. I think that's a great command for us that we should go and tell our friends, tell all the people around us what Christ says here that how much the Lord has done for you, whether it's just in your day-to-day -day life, but especially in saving us, especially if you're a Christian, in the fact that you have salvation from your sins and how he has had mercy on you. That because his son came and died on the cross, that if we respond to the gospel in repentance and faith, we no longer have to face that eternal separation, that judgment that is coming because Christ's death and resurrection covers that for us. We should want to go and tell our friends, tell everybody of the great mercy and the amazing things that the Lord has done for us today. Thirdly, we are doing another full psalm today. These ones have been short for the past couple of days, and this is the same. So Psalm 54, Psalm chapter 54. To the choir master with stringed instruments, a mascal of David, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, Is not David hiding among us? O oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Yeah, so uh, another psalm, I mean, again, we see David crying out, Oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your sight. Hear my prayer and give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have arisen. Uh, but he, he finds hope and says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. So we see that, that even though David is again being pursued by his enemies, his trust is in God and in God alone, knowing that God will protect him, God will save him, and God will help him get away, and even God will take care of his enemies. So we see a great faith from David again, even though he's being pursued, even though he's running for his life, he knows that God will protect him. Finally, we'll be doing Judges today, 12 through 14. So a couple chapters in Judges today, Judges 12 through chapter 14. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, 
Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites. And the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said no, they said to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters he gave in marriage outside his clan, and 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ijalon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon the son of Hillel the Pirithonite judged Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons who rode on seventy donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon the son of Hillel the Pirithonite died and was buried at Pirithon in the land of Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the... So here's where we're going to get to see uh, the story of Samson. So another really interesting thing going on here in Judges. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a bird offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering in our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanadan, between Zorah and Eshdil. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters. Did you catch in that chapter uh, maybe a little foreshadowing or something that we see is not supposed to happen to Samson that might play a big part later in this story? If you did, drop a comment below and let us know what important thing we learned is not supposed to happen to Samson. What important thing Samson should never do. Comment that down below because it's going to play a part later in the story. So let's continue with Judges 14 and the story of, the of the Philistines. 
Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives, or among all our people, that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. After some days he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion, and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on, eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, Let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. And they said to him, Put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me, you do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother. And shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day he told her, because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and struck down thirty men of the town, and took their spoil, and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger he went back to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. After some days of... So yeah, we end there with a sad part happening for Samson. He doesn't get to marry the person who he wants to. Um, and he uh, goes on a little bit of a rampage. And we're going to see that Samson does that a couple times. And he does a couple things that are pretty crazy. And just insane amount of strength that we... I mean, just very interesting to see and i mean as we see even as he kills the lion it's very clear the the writer of judges is saying this is coming from the spirit of the lord this is not samson so uh, interesting for us to note i mean interesting even to note that um he kills the lion and then he comes back to it later something that he's not really supposed to be doing according to the law they're not supposed to touch uh dead things dead animals that would make him unclean so probably not the best thing for him to do but um, just interesting as we see that God is going to use Samson to free his people, to help his people out as they are kind of enslaved right now. Um, so that's the end of our reading. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for another day to glorify you, Lord. We ask now that you would, God, allow us to, to find ways to serve the people around us, God. That you would give us a desire to love one another, Lord, and to show that love for one another and that love for you in how we are, are acting, God, to seek to serve and build up our neighbors around us, God. We ask, Lord, that you would cause us to have a desire to find those practical ways today, tomorrow, and forever to build up and serve the people around us. Not only the people who are easy to love, but our neighbors who are hard to love, the people around us who are hard to love, Lord God. And and God, we, we thank you so much for, for letting us read your word today, God. And I pray that we would go to our friends, Father God, and tell them how much the Lord has done for us and how you have had mercy on us, Father God. I make that my prayer today, that we would all seek to go do that. In your name we pray, amen. Men. And yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you have a great Thursday. I can't wait to see you guys tomorrow again for another time in the word. And we have our prayer night tomorrow night as well. I hope you have a great day, Plants and Pillars. Bye.